The topic of today is uh, imperialism of war, and uh, it's a rather large topic. I'm going to focus rather on the war, talk about war and our policy towards war. Um, the um, war is one of those uh, moments when the whole of society puts all the contradictions and all the uh, conflicts in society are opposed at its sharp, in, at sharpest point. And it's, it's rather, uh, so all, all those uh, conflicts that are brewing between, uh, between nations or between classes under the surface for a period of time are opposed in the most sharpest way uh, in a war. Obviously, mobilizes, particularly, in the, uh, particularly if you're talking about the world wars, mo what they call total war, mobilizes the whole of society, gears it uh, for one purpose, and that is the uh, destruction of the enemy, the killing of uh, people, uh, the destruction of productive forces of the enemy, etc., etc. So it's a rather important um, uh, moment or uh, part, uh, part, important development in human society. Um, and as Clausewitz pointed out, war really is the continuation of politics by other means. And that's something that's often lost, uh, uh, particularly on the left, uh, when you're discussing war. People tend to see it as a kind of um, a kind of plague on society, something that's unnecessary, something that is um, uh, avoidable. But really, as long as you have conflicts within society, particularly conflicts between between different ruling classes, the war will inevitably arise. And uh, this is uh, this is something that is lost on the pacifists. Uh, politics itself is really just an ex uh, extension of economics. So the uh, conf uh, conflicts within uh, the economy between the different <coughs> companies and, and the different companies competing on a world scale then become between the different nations. Uh, and then obviously war becomes, so from the economy, the competition between companies in the economic sphere become politics, diplomacy, comp uh, conflicts in the dip diplomatic sphere between different nations and then eventually wh when those cannot be resolved in a peaceful manner you have war uh, to resolve uh, the question. Um, uh, the same goes for class, class war, a civil war a war within a nation is once again a question of the contradictions that arise in the economy between the different classes that eventually spill over into the political plane in the first instance but eventually also when they're particularly sharp onto the military plane uh, and become a civil war or even sometimes occasionally war between nations. Um, the first, uh, I would like to make this maybe three points. First point is that not all wars are imperialist wars that's something that's sometimes lost on people. Uh, is, we have not, um, which relates to the second uh, point, the character of wars and our, our attitude towards war is determined by the character of that war. Uh, and not, it's not determined by who started the war. That's a completely secondary question. If you remember, for example, the uh, beginning of the Second World War, when uh, Hitler invaded Poland, he dressed up a number of Polish soldier, uh, German soldiers as Polish soldiers and had them, well, it wasn't even German soldier, was it? I can't remember now. He dressed up anyway, he faked a Polish attack on Germany in order to then say, oh no, Poland was the aggressor and then he invaded and smashed uh, the Polish army. Uh, and so this question of who started the war is completely secondary and if you rely on that to judge whether, whose side you're supporting, you wound up getting it completely wrong. My, for example, completely hypothetically, uh, well, so not completely hypothetically, but if, if you, for example, consider a, uh, a war of national liberation, it would typically be started by the nation that wants to liberate itself from an imperial power. And thus, we, we would obviously support the war of national liberation against the imperial power, but we would not, even though they started it. So it's not like a question of who starts the war, but the character of that war determines our attitude in the war. Uh, thirdly, even once you explain the character of the war, it doesn't necessarily uh, decide exactly how we pose the question. We can have two different wars with the same general character, uh, for example the First and Second World War, and I will deal with this later, but our position on those wars, how we explain our position on those wars, uh, will, will change depending on the circumstance. And we'll get into this a bit later.
And for this particular reason, the fact that we have to consider the context in which the wars take place and the character of those wars, I'm going to, have to I'm going to go through this question chronologically and uh, giving the historical context you know, to explain how Marxists over, uh, his, uh, over, uh, in different historical circumstances have uh, posed the question of war, how they related to the war in a different manner. Um, we're going to start with the Franco-Prussian War. The Franco-Prussian War uh, was in 1870 to 71, and it uh, was a war between uh, France and Prussia. Now, the, in Germany at the time, Germany had had a revolution in 1848, which was uh, crushed by the counter-revolutionary forces. Really, the task of that revolution would, was to unify Germany, uh, creating a unified Germany, a unified republic, uh, in Germany and complete the democratic revolution. But as I said, it was crushed by, with uh, various uh, different uh, armies who invaded Germany and crushed the revolution. That was the Prussian army, the uh, Russian army, uh, the Danish army also was involved. Uh, there was a number of different armies that basically crushed this German revolution. Uh, but the task, and thus all these different principalities, Germany was divided up into like lots of different little mini kingdoms uh, uh, at that time, and they remained. And this represented a barrier to the development of capitalism in Germany, and, uh, and this task remained unresolved, the unification of Germany. And what happened was that the, the Prussian state instead became, started implementing or resolving this task from above. So rather than revolution from, above, from below, it started to unify Germany from above by military conquest. Uh, one little, through different wars, they also didn't necessarily conquer them, but through alliances, diplomatic deals and so on, they wound up incorporating and uh, putting underneath themselves all the different uh, German states. Um, and uh, Marx and Engels actually supported, although they had opposed the Prussian state in 1848 and the reactionary role it played at that time, still they saw the unification of Germany, even carried out with, uh, in the way it was done, was still a progressive step. I prepared the way for the development of productive force and, and the, creating, the creation of the German working class. And the Franco-Prussian War was really the final step in this process. And uh, and from that point of view, Marx and Engels actually supported the Prussians in that war, in the early stages of the war. So when, uh, because um, in order for the, uh, because it was posed as a unification war, which France obviously opposed. France being opposed to German unification for imperialist reasons, i.e. Germ France had unified itself, had a strong uh, imperialist, as a strong imperialist nation, one well, of the two foremost imperialist nations at that time, they opposed Germany accomplishing the same, either unification of Germany, because a weak and divided Germany would be easier to uh, control from that point of view. So France's intentions were imperialist, and Germany was, in a sense, was at least partially progressive. But uh, as the war progressed, Prussia won the war, they uh, invaded France, and the character of the war changed. German unification had been achieved, France was defeated, and what happened was the French workers rose up in Paris. Uh, the French, the Paris Commune, as you're probably aware, 1871, and the Prussians and the French bourgeoisie, so the Prussian ruling class and the French bourgeoisie, united against the Paris Commune and the, French wor and the Paris workers. And this, again, completely then transformed the attitude that uh, Marx and Engels took, where obviously they would support the French, the Paris workers, and opposed uh, the um, counter-revolutionary uh, role that the Prussians were playing in the conflict uh, uh, in France. Are you giving them notes every ten? No? Uh, and therefore, uh, they changed their position and obviously demanded this withdrawal of the troops uh, from uh, Prussia. It were, they actually declared a ceasefire. The French ruling class and the German ruling class, they declared a ceasefire, whereby the Germans uh, would no longer attack, um, they wouldn't attack the French armies anymore, uh, and wait effectively for the, uh, uh, for the revolution to be crushed. So, this, so, this, so even during this war, the attitude of Marx and Engels changed 
in relate, how they related to this war, what demands they would pose and so on. Obviously the proletarian revolution in France that took place at that time or in Paris was far superseded, the interests of that revolution far superseded any other considerations that might have existed at the time. Um, so uh, perhaps a well-known example is the question of World War I. Now, obviously the unification of, of Germany created opportunities for uh, the development of German capitalism. But German capitalism developed much later than the others. In the late 19th century, the main imperial powers divided up the whole of the world between themselves. And I say the main imperial powers, we're talking primarily France and Britain. We basically divided up, the whole of Africa was divided up uh, between those two imperial powers. And a lot of the straight lines that you see on the African map they were created at, at this particular time. They also divided up the Middle East to some extent, the different spheres of influence and so on. The whole world was basically carved up between the main imperialist powers. So when Germany then approaches the scene and uh, the other imperial powers, they oppose Germany. Germany, uh, Germany develops its industries, becomes far more efficient at producing uh, goods than uh, the, uh, the British or the French. They're, they can produce them more cheaply and more effectively. And as a result, the French and the British then cut the Germans out of their market in their colonies, right? So the, the Germans weren't allowed to access on the same terms the colonies uh, as the British industries were. As a means of protecting the British industries from this competition. And so the natural response then obviously of German capitalism is to try to fight to regain, to gain these markets, to try to get, gain these markets where they can export to and sell their goods. And because they were late on the scene, they then had to fight other imperial nations for these particular markets. And this became uh, increasingly obvious uh, over the first uh, decade of the 20th century. Uh, the increasing number of conflicts with the German imperialism, and once again, German imperialism here acts naturally as the aggressor, and much like China today acts as the aggressor because it's trying to fight, because the world is carved up and it's trying to gain an, a foothold in various places, but in doing so, it obviously comes into conflict with all these other powers, and therefore it becomes the aggressor effectively. They want to change the status quo, and therefore they become the aggressor. Um, so the development of German capitalists increases contradiction. You have a number of different crises where Germany in various ways tried to provoke or poke and see how much they can get away with without resorting to all-out war. That's the Agadir crisis, there is the gunboat crisis and so on, a number of things, where, particularly regarding Africa, uh, where Germany was trying to expand its influence. Um, but it didn't necessarily, at this point in time, it didn't result uh, in war. Another factor was the weakness and the collapse of uh, the Ottoman Empire on the one hand and the Austro-Hungarian Empire on the other, uh, which was particularly played out in the Balkans, where now there had arisen a number of new nations out and the, uh, which have fought for their independence. The Greeks, for example, became independent in 1827, I think, and through a number of successive wars, gained uh, the, um, the, the territory which it uh, today uh, is. But there was a number of successive wars throughout the 19th century for the Greek to, Greece to establish the current borders. And this particularly concentrated during the Balkan Wars, there was two successive Balkan Wars, when these uh, new states First there was this, the war which, uh, with a number of new states together fighting against the Ottomans and there was a second war in which these new states started fighting each other um, uh, for little bits of land and little bits of people. Uh, and you can read about this, uh, Alan has written a rather detailed, article about, uh, detailed articles about this uh, on the website and also obviously you have Trotsky's writings on the Balkan Wars which do go into some detail about this. Um, but this was the kind of scene that was set, which created all these conflicts. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, because of its weakness, was very uh, interested in what was happening in the Balkans. It was feeling threatened by developments 
because obviously Austro-Hungarian Empire was composed of all kinds of different nations and obviously the, the wars of national liberation which was fought by these different Balkan countries against the Ottomans obviously threatened to uh, destabilize uh, all the, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and all the nations that were contained in, it, in that particularly in Bosnia and the other parts of what became Yugoslavia uh, after the First World War. Um, the Second International actually analysed these developments and they drew the correct conclusions, i.e. that imperialist contradictions are increasing and that the working class must oppose this internationally. However, uh, in the early stages they actually tinged this with a lot of pacifism. I'm going to give you... So they, in 1907, at the Stuttgart conference, uh, they actually discussed the resolution and voted it through. I can't remember if it was unanimously, but anyway, it was uh, widely supported. And what the Congress, uh, so the resolution said this, the Congress is convinced that under the pressure of the proletariat, by a serious use of arbitration in place of miserable measures of government, the benefits of disarmament can be secured to all nations making it possible to employ the enormous expenditure of money and energy which are swallowed up by military armaments and wars for cultural purposes. Now, so that, that's the pacifist part of this resolution. Basically saying, oh yeah, through like, you know, we can convince the ruling class that wars are not necessary. In fact, we would better to spend this money on other things. That, that's... Um, and then it con continues, and this was the uh, amendment or the, that was put by the left at the Congress, Rosa Luxemburg and Lenin, as well as others. If, war, if a war threatens to break out, it is the duty of the working classes and their parliamentary representatives in the countries involved, supported by the coordinating activity of the International Socialist Bureau, to exert every effort in order to prevent the outbreak of war by the means they consider most effective, which naturally vary according to the sharpening of the class struggle and the sharpening of the general political situation. Well, this is obviously um, key. Obviously, the working class opposes the war with uh, measures which depend on the context, but, this is, uh, but basically it's, it's the utmost duty of the working class parties to prevent the outbreak of war. The, the caveat there obviously is, oh, depending on circumstances. So that obviously leaves the door open then for national sections to um, you know, vary their level of response. So and this was a key thing for the trade union bureaucrats at that time. Uh, they didn't want, they did oppose the idea of a general strike in case of war to break out. They opposed militant measures that were threatening their positions. So this kind of way of very of creating like a varied um, response, although correct in principle, obviously you're not going to have exactly the same way of you uh, tackling the question in any circumstance, but this kind of varied response left the door open to basically do nothing, which has eventually never happened. But then it continues the resolution. In case war should break out anyway, it is the duty to intervene in favour of its speedy termination and with all their powers to utilise the economic and political crisis created by the war to rouse the masses and de thereby to hasten the downfall of capitalist rule. And this is the, the, really the key point of uh, the Marxist position of war. It's actually using the war in order to um, hasten the downfall of capitalism, i.e. a revolutionary development. And this was precisely what was to happen after the First World War. Revolutions broke out all over Europe and it was the task of Marxists at that particular point to use those revolutions and the revolutionary convulsions after the war in order to hasten downfall of capitalist rule, i.e. to take power, like the Russians, uh, the Bolsheviks did in Germany, that's in Russia. Um, but, as you, but the war also, like this resolution was like uh, a bit confused with different kind of pacifist elements that basically uh, ignored the fact that the ruling class, uh, the economic contradictions are the, uh, are the reason for war, not some kind of political misunderstanding, which is the typical pacifist position. So this, um, uh, so this, this was like a kind of resolution that gave uh, uh, you know, a little bit to everyone, right? It faced in all kinds of directions. It didn't really clarify uh, clearly the position that, uh, of the Marxists. Um, 
And there was, at the time, circulating a lot of ideas about this. For example, there was a guy called Norman Angel, uh, I think it's pronounced, um, a British guy who wrote the book saying, uh, I can't remember it was, uh, basically say, I can't remember the title of the book, but it's something like, War is Impossible. And his whole argument is, because of the development of world trade, all the countries are interconnected, the world economy is so interconnected, that war would be so disastrous, there's no chance that uh, the different imperialist powers will go to war with each other, right? Because they're too dependent on each other. Uh, and this was an argument, obviously, that had a reflection inside the, the Socialist International. And it turned out to be completely false, because it's not, it's not necessarily the interconnectedness that's going to stop uh, wars. As, uh, and it, this is the same argument, incidentally, that is used in relation to the European Union. You know, the European Union is a peace project, you know, you unite G Germany and France and they're never going to go to war again. Well, in reality, before World War I, you had more and more interconnectedness of the uh, economy and the World War I actually put a uh, clear end to that. In some ways, the interconnectedness of the world economy, development of productive forces for world trade and so on, prepares the way, once an economic crisis breaks out, uh, for an increased con uh, conflicts between nations because of a world market, the struggle over the world market in a shrinking economy increases the contradictions between nations, as you can see now with the European Union. In Basel, uh, in 1913, they, the Second National met again and they considered a new uh, manifesto or resolution on the question of war. And this resolution is actually far better. But at this point in time, the degeneration had developed a lot further in the Second International. And although they voted for this resolution, it actually, they basically voted on it in the understanding they were never going to carry it out. Um, so it was a completely cynical move in order to sort of, yeah, satisfy the left wing and so on, but they didn't actually ever intend to carry it out. And it's particularly regards to, it was considered utopian, basically. But this resolution is far better, it explains, um, uh, explains it very clearly. It contains, it's removed those pacifist phrases about the possibility of arbitration and so on, it removes those and only keeps uh, the last two paragraphs more or less that I read out, that if a war threatens to break out, it is the duty of the working classes and the parliament representative to exert every effort in order to prevent the outbreak of war by the means they consider most effective. And in case of war should break out, it is their duty to intervene in favour of its speedy termination and with all their powers to utilise the economic and political crisis created by the war to rouse the people and thereby ha to hasten the downfall of capitalist rule. So here we have these statements. That is the first two, par almost the first two paragraphs of uh, this uh, Basel Manifesto. And then it continues uh, along the same line, analysing the different uh, contradictions that are developing, particularly in the Balkans which were threatening to lead to the breakout of the war. And it ends with uh, an appeal to peace and to fight uh, against the war. But you have now removed these kind of pacifist clauses that was there before. Um, when war actually broke out in 1914, it actually followed more or less the lines that had been put forward in the resolutions. But the problem is, obviously, a resolution is only a paper it's only paper, you might vote for it in a particular circumstance for whatever reason, but unless you're actually going to carry it out, it's completely pointless. There's no good actually having developed the most advanced analysis if you're not actually going to uh, put it into practice. Um, and the whole thing became a big shambles. All the, uh, and all, all kinds of excuses started appearing. Uh, the first thing, obviously, the first vote was the... Um, the German Social Democrats were the first to vote in favour of war credits. And they used this on the basis of, uh, they claimed, Russian aggression. I.e. we must stop the Russian aggression because the Tsar had mobilised his armies against Austria-Hungary, right? And that meant they also mobilised against Germany because Germany was allied to Austria-Hungary. Uh, and as a result, the, so then the, the German Social Democrats declared it's a war of Russian aggression in order to stop Tsarism uh, conquering Europe, the uh, old bogey bear of Tsarism from 1848 uh, when the uh, Tsar intervened in the, uh, to crush the democratic revolutions of 1848. So they re resurrected this and used this as an excuse then to declare for war credits. 
And the German ruling class wasn't more stupid. They were also, they were just playing on this card, right? They're saying, oh, we need to defend the democratic gains of Germany and so on against the autocracy of Sardom. Uh, and uh, probably were tinged with a bit of racism about the autocrat, the, you know, Asiatic hordes, etc., etc. Um, and then, but obviously, the, by Germany declaring war on Russia, that also meant it had to declare war on France, because France was allied to Russia. So the next thing was that, uh, obviously, the French Socialist Party, finding itself in a position where Germany had declared war on France, that, uh, Germ uh, that uh, France, uh, Germany was then the aggressor, <coughs> supposedly, uh, why France had to intervene on the side of Russia is beyond anyone's uh, understanding, but anyway. Uh, but Fran but um, Germany now declared war on France, or maybe it was the other way around, either way. Uh, they invaded Belgium and France in order to try to defeat the French quickly, in order to then turn their again uh, attention against uh, Russia. Uh, and so the French socialists, fearing all oh, the German uh, aggression, German autocracy and so on, they then started, uh, they then voted for their national bourgeoisie and went uh, into war. Then there became obviously the question of Belgium, the Belgian commerce were aware, little neutral Belgium, and there was a lot of uh, discussion, oh, uh, Germany has violated Belgian neutrality and so on and so on. They completely ignored the fact that all the powers in the, con in the, in the if there was a border break up, they all had plans to invade Belgium. Just so happened that Germans got there first. Um, the French had plans to invade Belgium, both in the First World War and the Second World War. The British, the same. Uh, the, the British uh, war plans uh, against Germany involved landing a force in Belgium and then proceeding to use that to attack uh, uh, Germany. Uh, the reason is that you got uh, uh, in the uh, east side of Belgium, you got a mountain range. So whoever gets to the mountain range first has a strategic advantage over the others. So therefore, that's why you need to get to the mountain range first. Obviously, Germany won that uh, race, uh, and quite deliberately so. Um, so this, this different kind of, then obviously there came the, uh, all kinds of questions raised. Or oh, what about the right of uh, Belgium to national self-determination and so on? And obviously this is a completely secondary question. So you've got a major world war, major imperialist war, where all, involving all the major imperialist powers, and it is not a question here of this or that country's right to self-determination. It's not a question of Serbia's right to self-determination. It's not a question of Bosnia's right to self-determination or Belgium's right to self-determination. That's not the question which is really posed in this war. And the overarching interest of the world proletariat to, for unity and internationalism overrides any consideration about uh, individual uh, countries uh, and their... Um, uh, uh, right to self-determination, which incidentally was just obviously a complete fig leaf. All the countries were determined to invade Belgium and violate its neutrality. Uh, so this obviously had tremendous consequences for uh, the Second International. It completely broke it apart. I mean, how are you going to have? You basically have all the different sections of the Second International voting to support their own bourgeoisie and launch an attack against the, the uh, workers of another country. The only uh, exceptions to this rule was the Russians and the Serbs who maintained the internationalist position throughout the war. Uh, after s the German uh, Social Democrats, which were supposed to be like the kind of Marxist bastion, they uh, uh, were one of the first to vote in favor of the war. Uh, later on, a few months down the line, they a large section of them then uh, changed their mind uh, and started voting against the war and formed and the, formed then the breakup group, the Independent Social Democrats. Um, but that was too late, too little, too late, as they say. It didn't fundamentally alter the position. The, the only ones who had voted against the war in Germany uh, Luxem uh, was Liebknecht. Luxembourg couldn't be in Parliament because she was a woman. Uh, but Liebknecht who was in Parliament, he had voted against the war, he was the only one who did so, and he wound up being expelled uh, from the party, uh, Social Democrats, and obviously formed then the Spartacus League, which eventually transformed into the German Communist Party. So the Third International is really founded on the principle of opposing uh, the war. Uh, it could be added that when uh, this question of a war became 
uh, caused some confusion in the early stages of the um, uh, development of the Third International. At the Simmerwald conference, for example, uh, they all, uh, all kinds of different tendencies were present, and quite a number of them were pacifist, i.e. they were against the war, but they didn't realize the point of a, po that war is inevitable <coughs> under capitalism, and the point of uh, the task of Marxists is not to sort of say, oh, it's very terrible to have a war, but the task of Marxists is to use the war in order to overthrow society and thereby putting an end to war, uh, uh, finally. Um, so, well, I'm not, I won't be able to go into the details of the development of the Third International, but basically over time the debate clarified and the Third International was then founded on um, a clear revolutionary grounds, obviously, uh, a few years later, although many of the sections retained uh, quite strong pacifist tendency within them, uh, the Swedish party, for example, being one of them, uh, where the pacifists were in a majority for a number of years. Even into the Stalinist period, it played a, a big role. Um, and then we come to the uh, Second World War. Now, the Second World War was an imperialist war between all the major imperialist uh, <coughs> powers uh, on the planet. The, now, there was not only Germany that was uh, say, 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 fighting against the constraints imposed on them by the division of the world. Obviously, the First World War had meant that even more than before, Ger uh, France and Britain uh, took over bigger chunks of the colonies. Um, and even more than before, they dominated the whole um, uh, planet. But there were new imperialist powers that were rising. Uh, and there were three of them. It was obviously Germany, as mentioned before, but it was also Japan, which had developed very rapidly from the late 19th century and become a major for pa uh, force uh, uh, by the time of uh, in the 1930s. It was the United States, which was really the key, uh, the economy was developing and because of the size of the country, it was uh, uh, one of it became the strongest imperial power before the Second World War. The US, uh, none of these three countries had any colonies to speak of. The US had the Philippines and they had some influence over Latin America, but even there they were not uncontested. And um, so these, uh, these, um, these three countries were straining against the, uh, the division of the world that had occurred up at this time. And so the Second World War, just like the First World War, was a war, an imperialist war, a war between uh, redivision of the world and the world markets. But there was an added element to this particular war. And this conditioned the attitude that uh, the Marxists took towards the war. Obviously, in general, we recognize uh, the, uh, the Trotskyists at that time in Britain and elsewhere, they recognized that this was an imperialist war. But there was this added element that basically the uh, one of the imperialist powers, i.e. Germany, was governed by a fascist dictator who basically um, uh, who had smashed the working class in Germany and uh, was preparing to smash the working class and the trade union movement wherever these, uh, the conquering armies went. And obviously workers not stupid, they could see this. They could see what would happen if Hitler was to come uh, invade their country and uh, uh, conquer and um, uh, occupy their country. And they were not particularly keen on the idea. So although in general, the general uh, position on the question of the character of the war remained the same, but there were certain particular considerations here which had to be taken into account when formulating the position in relation to the war. And this became even clearer as uh, Hitler invaded France. Because the French bourgeoisie, they put up a little bit of uh, resistance in the early stages, but then they very quickly capitulated to uh, Hitler. And they, uh, I should read you a little quote here. Uh, Once before, when the Prussians were at the gates of Paris in 1870, and the workers had been armed, they seized control of the first success, they seized control in the first successful workers' uprising in history. The Daily Telegraph correspondent in France write on June 17th, danger of a communist uprising and civil war compelled the French government to sue for peace. Uh, 
They handed Paris intact to the Germans. We're talking about what happened now in uh, uh, 1940. Am I right? Yes, I'm right. In, in June, July 1940. France was betrayed. The real fifth column was the capitulation government of financiers, manufacturers, millionaires and generals. It was they who sold the French people into the hands of Hitler. Rather than lose all their profits by victory of the French masses, these patriots preferred to assure themselves of a few scraps from the tables of the Nazis. It was actually what happened all over Europe. The ruling class went over uh, almost in, in its entirety to Hitler once his armies came to the gates. They had the option, obviously, of mobilizing the masses and fighting um, and arming the masses uh, in, a, in a war against Hitler, which probably meant that Hitler would have lost. But rather than doing that, they capitulated uh, far before, be, uh, before that point. Uh, in order then to utilize Hitler, Hitler's smashing of the working class for their own purposes. And obviously, even though they became subordinate to the interests of the German bourgeoisie, they would still get a few crumbs of the table, which was rather better than, um, uh, than uh, uh, losing everything in the, if the workers were to take power. It should be added to this that before the actual outbreak of the war, most of the uh, Western countries had in some ways or another tried to appease Hitler, tried to make a deal with him in order to get Hitler to attack the Soviet Union, i.e. to get Hitler to crush the, uh, the only, albeit deformed, worker state that existed, uh, and thereby utilizing Hitler to, uh, to, uh, uh, to f fight the threat of communism, as they saw it. Uh, and in, along with those lines also you had a lot of anti-Semitism rising in all these countries. There was anti-Semitism, officially sponsored anti-Semitism in the United States, in Britain and in France. And the French ruling class was very happy to hand over um, uh, lists of Jewish people and so on to uh, the German um, occupation authorities. Obviously also lists of communists list of socialists and trade unionists to the German occupation authorities in order to make their job of smashing the working class uh, easier. And the same happened in all the other European countries uh, where uh, uh, the German armies reached. Even to so some of the neutral countries uh, did this. Uh, and the Social Democrats participated as much as uh, uh, anyone else. Um, but uh, this uh, but this, uh, this posed the question slightly differently, but obviously the, 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 germ, the, uh, the remaining uh, countries, so we're talking particularly of Britain, the, America, uh, the US didn't enter the war until 1941, if I'm mistaken, I'm not mistaken, um, and, uh, or 40, ah, lost, lost track of it. But anyway, the British were obviously isolating Europe. The Hitler had conquered most of Europe, bar uh, that which laid under the Soviet Union, and a couple of neutral countries like um, Spain and uh, Sweden. Uh, but most of Europe had been conquered by uh, uh, the German armies, and Britain stood alone. And so the British ruling class, in order to, def uh, to mobilize for the war, used this question of fascism quite intelligently in order to mobilize the workers and get them to participate in the war effort and also accept conditions which they would ne not necessarily otherwise have accepted. And I'm going to read you a little quote again from 1940. Already Chamberlain, Churchill and other spokesmen of the government have monotonously reiterated that the whole German people is responsible for prolonging the war, thereby providing the assertion of Goebbels proving the assertion of Goebbels that the aim of the Allies is to starve Germany, not to destroy Nazism. This gives an insight into what Europe will look like under the denomination of Threadneedle Street, i.e. the British. The system of Asiatic despotism will per pervade Europe, whichever side wins the war. It is this fear that drives the German masses to support the Nazi regime. They have good reasons to dread the prospect of becoming the slaves of British and French capital. If you remember, in, uh, at the end of the First World War, the Treaty of Versailles completely decimated uh, Germany. It, uh, the blockade, naval blockade, which was kept going for several months after the German capitulation, 
uh, had starved the German people and it created massive economic problems. The French even at one point invaded Germany in 1923, I think, in order to um, uh, pull as much resources as it could uh, out of Germany. The, um, the, the, uh, tre and the Treaty of Versailles obviously completely decimated Germany, completely redrew the map of Germany, uh, including violating the right of uh, many Germans to national self-determination. And so there was a reason, a genuinely uh, a legitimate reason for the Germans to fear what would to take place, the German masses to fear what would take place if once again the British and French won the war. And this obviously mobilized them uh, to fight and strengthen the morale of Hitler's armies, whereas, other, whereas otherwise they wouldn't really have seen much point of these wars. And this then uh, led uh, um, uh, this was then forming the background of how we, uh, Ted Grant and the other uh, comrades of the revolutionary, com well at that time it was the Workers International League, posed the question of war. How, um, what program they put forward for the workers and what's called the, uh, the proletarian military policy. And what they said was, disarm the capitalists and arm the workers for the struggle against Nazism and the capitalist fifth column at home. Take over the mines, the banks, the railways and big industry without compensation. Give freedom and self-determination to India and the colonies. Repeal all anti-working class legislation. Appeal to the German, the French and European workers to support the social struggle against Hitler. So the program was basically, right, we do a revolution in, in Britain, Take the um, uh, disarm the capitalists, I nationalize the uh, commanding heights of the economy, and, and then uh, uh, liberate the colonies, which is a key question, because actually, incidentally, a lot of um, colonies were rebelling at this time, and a lot of the British efforts in the Second World War was not directed against Hitler or even the Japanese, but against the colonial uprisings in various parts of the empire, including India which was the jewel in the crown, as they call it. So this question of liberating the colonies was a key demand. Obviously also linked to the character of the war, of imperialist war, about the redivision of the colonies, where the British workers would say, we take power and we give up all our claims to colonies. We will not, we will not be an imperialist power taking over and uh, subjugating other peoples. We'll give ever, all the peoples their freedoms. And we uh, urge them those liberated people to join us in the struggle against Hitler and fascism and German imperialism. But obviously you cannot do, make that appeal as long as, the German, as long as you're supporting your own uh, bourgeoisie, as long as you're supporting uh, a, the, uh, the British imperialist interest in suppressing the colonial people and the British imperialist interest in fighting the war for the prospect of redivision of the colonies and obviously of plundering of Germany, which was clearly the, Germ the British war aims. And so this is a, it's not entirely different, if you think about it, to what actually uh, was uh, the proposal of the Basel uh, Manifesto. Actually, once again, we're talking about utilizing the war in order to overthrow capitalism, hasten the downfall of capitalist rule, um, and then uh, using the war to actually achieve uh, the, uh, a socialist revolution. But it's posed slightly differently depending on the circumstance. It's actually quite similar to how, uh, it's very similar to how Lenin, although Lenin was very adamant, if you remember the phrase, um, uh, the, the uh, victory of uh, one's own imperial power is the lesser of two evils, uh, he, he described in, in the war. What? The Sorry, the defeat, of course. <laughs> <laughs> the defeat of our own imperial powers is the lesser of two evils. So uh, that was what he said at the beginning of the war. But once the revolution had, um, had developed in Russia in the beginning of 1917, he slightly changed his tune. He didn't actually change his fundamental position. He said, that it's no different. The, um, uh, this hasn't changed the character of the war. Just because you've replaced the Tsar with uh, Prince Lvov, or whoever it was at the time, uh, I, uh, you replaced a kind of feudal aristocratic government with a capitalist government, it doesn't actually fundamentally change the war uh, 
as such. It's still a war for the imperialists, still an imperialist war for the conquest of markets and territories. The banks remain the same, the companies, the big financial institutions remain the same, the big industries remain in the same ownership as before. You now, it's just that you changed a few people at the top. That's all that has taken place. And therefore, he said, you must complete the revolution and, if, and then uh, issue an offer of peace to the German people and the German masses, and if they, do, they don't accept that, then you can fight the war. And then the war would be a different character. That is, if the workers take power, then there will be a different character to the war if you're fighting to defend the gains of uh, a workers' revolution compared to the fighting to defend the interests of uh, uh, imperialist powers. It's actually quite, quite similar to the way that Ted Grant and the others posed it uh, during the Second World War. Um, and so this is a way for the Marxists to link in to the desires of the British working class to actually fight Hitler, Hitlerism and fascism, but at the same time not succumbing to uh, what the Communist Party did, which is to support your own bourgeoisie support your own bourgeoisie and their rather racist and um, uh, imperialist ambitions uh, as regards to Germany. The propaganda of the British became increasingly hostile to the German people, increasingly anti-German, which obviously then strengthened also Hitler's base among the German masses and the morale of the soldiers, thinking that the, uh, if the British were to win, this would be a disaster for the German people, which is probably well, well, it wound up not being the case, but that was p for particular circumstances. Uh, and the same actually went for Stalin's policy in the East. The way that the Russians fought the war, on the very similar nationalist lines, with lots of massacres and attacks on German people, and uh, propaganda about the German people as a whole being responsible for Hitlerism or, or fascism, obviously had the same effect on that front as the uh, British uh, propaganda had on the Western Front. And the, uh, the, Ger the Hitler Nazi propaganda machine weren't more stupid. You know, they took these uh, newspaper articles, headlines, etc. and they published them in their own press, of course. Why not? Uh, in order to strengthen the morale of the British soldiers, uh, sorry, of the German soldiers. And, this ob uh, and so this particular way is a way then of explaining to the uh, workers of Britain that fighting imperialists and fighting your own ruling class is actually the best way of fighting the war uh, against uh, fascism. If you, if you take power and uh, tell the German workers, we took and taken power, you do the same, you fight your imperialism, we've, we've dealt with ours, you deal with yours, and that will be a much better way of fighting the war than this particular way in which the British capitalism is proposing to do it. If you come to the present day, I would say this has somewhat limited application for the present uh, day. Obviously, the uh, war today is not going to be between the main imperial powers. But still, this question uh, of our attitude towards the war is continuously uh, arising in different circumstances. Uh, for example, in regards to Libya, in regards to Syria, and so on. The same position, fundamental position, arises that we must oppose our own bourgeoisie or in the first instance, and not start uh, in, each nat in each country we have uh, of primary duty is to oppose our own bourgeoisie, obviously opposing it in a skillful way, but that is the primary duty of Marxists. So when it comes to Syria, for example, we cannot be... Um, uh, there are some people on the left now in Britain who uh, want to call support the uh, demonstrations against Putin and so on. And obviously that's comp uh, that only plays into the hands of Boris Johnson, Theresa May and so on, uh, who want to uh, use this, uh, the crisis in Aleppo in order to uh, hide uh, the, um, the slaughter of innocents in uh, uh, Yemen or in Mosul, uh, Iraq and so on. In order to cover up for our own crimes, they're using this question of Aleppo. And obviously we, as Marxists, cannot in any way be part of that uh, uh, propaganda campaign. Uh, obviously if we were in Russia, the position would be different. The Russian, uh, Russian Marxists would most pose the question differently. They must oppose Putin, for, first of all, and they're only in the second instance explaining the nature of imperialism as a whole. So this, uh, this uh, um, this uh, question is uh, in some ways still relevant today, and obviously 
Another point is the Second World War really forms uh, a lot of thinking uh, and it's an important question to know because um, the discussions that take place among people, understanding our, the history and also providing, if some people ask us, so what would be your alternative to Hitler? What if Hitler were to break Britain? What would be our alternative? And then obviously we can provide an answer to that. There's lots of discussion also you can raise about the role of the Stalinists played during the Second World War in Britain and so on. Uh, but uh, I sadly don't have enough time. And maybe some comments were raised in the discussion. Thank you.